Introduction to Romans. The event that split history into before and after and changed the world took place about 30 years before Paul wrote this letter. The event, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus took place in a remote corner of the extensive Roman Empire, the province of Judea in Palestine. Hardly anyone noticed, certainly no one in busy and powerful Rome. And when this letter arrived in Rome, hardly anyone read it, certainly no one of influence. There was much to read in Rome. Imperial decrees, exquisite poetry, finely crafted moral philosophy, and much of it was world class. And yet, in no time, as such things go, this letter left all other writings in the dust, or all of those other writings in the dust. Paul's letter to the Romans has had a far larger impact on its readers than the volumes of all those Roman writers put together. The quick rise of this letter to a peak of influence in, is extraordinary. Written as it was by an obscure Roman citizen without connections, but when we read it for ourselves, we begin to realize that it is the letter itself that is truly extraordinary and that no obscurity in writer or readers could have kept it obscure for long. The letter to the Romans is a piece of exuberant and passionate thinking. This is the glorious life of the mind enlisted in the service of God. Paul takes the well-witnessed and devoutly believed fact of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth and thinks through its implications. How does it happen that in the death and resurrection of Jesus, world history took a new direction and at the same moment, the life of every man, woman, and child on the planet was eternally affected? What is God up to? What does it mean that Jesus saves? What's behind all this and where is it going? These are the questions that drive Paul's thinking. Paul's mind is supple and capacious. Luna. He takes logic and argument, poetry and imagination, scripture and prayer, creation and history and experience, and weaves them into this letter that has become the premier document of Christian theology. Who's this from? Unlike the peasants who had traveled with Jesus, Paul was an intellectual, schooled by the rabbis to analyze a Bible passage and exposed also to Greek logic. He bent his skills to the story of Jesus, but he didn't do this in some comfortable scholar's study. He worked out his ideas while walking mile after mile across rugged Turkey sunburned and rain soaked, camping in the middle of nowhere or occasionally staying in a flea infested inn. He puzzled about the cross while trying to light a cooking fire in a wooden ship that might go up in flames were it not for the seawater that kept splashing over the bow. Who's this too? Paul had never even seen Rome when he wrote to the several hundred Christians there. He had met a few of them traveling through other cities, but he wanted to introduce himself and his thinking to those who had only heard the gossip, not all of it good, about him. Some of them were Jews who thought of Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. Many were non-Jews sorting out what Jesus had to do with them. All of them debated how a follower of Jesus ought to live and they were keen to hear Paul's account firsthand. When? When was this written? Probably AD 57. Rome was immense for its time. Over a million people packed into dense housing blocks, elegant villas for the rich, and imposing marble public areas. The emperor's palace was a massive complex because most of the bureaucrats who ran the empire were officially servants in his household. Temples, some to the traditional gods, others to 
deified men like Julius Caesar were everywhere. Nero, now 20 years old, had become emperor at 17 after his mother murdered her husband, Emperor Claudius. Romans chapter 1. Paul, or pardon me, I, Paul, am a devoted slave of Jesus Christ on assignment, authorized as an apostle to proclaim God's words in Acts. I write this letter to all of the believers in Rome, God's friends. The sacred writings contain preliminary reports by the prophets on God's son. His descent from David's roots, his descent from David roots him in history. His unique identity as son of God was shown by the spirit when Jesus was raised from the dead, setting him apart as the Messiah, our master. Through him, we received both the generous gifts of his life and the urgent task of passing it on to others who receive it by entering into obedient trust in Jesus. You are who you are through this gift and call of Jesus Christ. And I greet you now with all the generosity of God our Father and our Master, Jesus the Messiah. I thank God through Jesus for every one of you. That's first. People everywhere keep telling me about your lives of faith. And every time I hear them, I thank him and God whom I love, who I so love to worship and serve by spreading the good news of his son, the message knows that every time I think of you in my prayers, which is practically all the time, I ask him to clear the way for me to come and see you. The longer this waiting goes on, the deeper the ache. I so want to be there to, to deliver God's gift in person and watch you grow stronger right before my eyes. But don't think I'm not expecting to get something out of this too. You have as much to give me as I do to you. Please don't misinterpret my failure to visit you friends you have no idea how many times i've made plans for rome i've been determined to get some personal enjoyment out of god's work among you as i have in so many other non-jewish towns and communities but something has always come up and prevented it everyone i meet it matters little whether they're mannered or rude smart or simple deepens my sense of interdependence and obligation and that's why I can't wait to get to you in Rome preaching this wonderful good news of God. It's news that I'm most proud to proclaim this extraordinary message of God's wonderful plan to rescue everyone who trusts him, starting with Jews and then right on to everyone else. God's way of putting people right shows up in the acts of faith, confirming what scripture has said all along. The person in right standing before God by trusting him really lives. Ignoring God leads to a downward spiral. But God's angry displeasure erupts as acts of human mistrust and wrongdoing and lying accumulate as people try to put a shroud over truth. But the basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes and there it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes as such can't see. Eternal power, for instance, and the mystery of his divine being. So nobody has a good excuse. What happened was this. People knew God perfectly well, but when they didn't treat him like God, refusing to worship him, they trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion so that there was neither sense nor direction left in their lives. They pretended to know it all, but were illiterate regarding life. They traded the glory of God, who holds the whole world in his hands, for cheap figurines that you can buy at any roadside stand. So, God said in effect, if that's what you want, that's what you get. It wasn't long before they were living in a pig pen smeared, in, smeared with filth, filthy inside and out. And all this because they traded the true God for a fake God and worshiped the God they made instead of the God who made them. 
the God we bless, the God who blesses us, oh yes, worse followed. Refusing to know God, they soon didn't know how to be human either. Women didn't know how to be women. Men didn't know how to be men. Sexually confused, they abused and defiled one another. Women with women, men with men. All lust, no love. And then they paid for it. Oh, how they paid for it. Emptied of God and love, godless and loveless wretches. Since they didn't bother to acknowledge God, God quit bothering them and let them run loose. And then all hell broke loose, rampant evil, grabbing and grasping, vicious backstabbing. They made life hell on earth with their envy, wanton killing, bickering and cheating. Look at them, mean, spirited, venomous, fork-tongued god bashers, bullies, swaggerers, insufferable windbags. They keep inventing new ways of wrecking lives. They ditch their parents when they get in the way. Stupid, slimy, cruel, cold-blooded. And it's not as if they don't know better. They know perfectly well they're spitting in God's face. And they don't care worse. They hand out prizes to those who do the worst things best.